want to thank Michael and Brother Brantley for the invitation. It's certainly been a joy to be here and to be among some good speakers and some people that I've admired from far for many, many years. And it's, uh, it's quite a humbling experience when you think about the stand that this church takes with the truth and has done for so many years. And you think about all the wonderful, faithful, sound preaching that has come from this pulpit. That's humbling for me. It's very humbling indeed. And so I thank you for the opportunity to speak not only tonight, but t Tuesday. Long before IBM, long before Microsoft and Apple, long before the American typewriter invented somewhere in the 1860s, there were some flashes of it prior to that, but it wasn't formulated really until the 1860s. Prior to Johannes Gutenberg's 1450 printing press, the Bible was written. The Bible was written down. It was copied and it was disseminated to various regions and cultures. Upon the invention of that Gutenberg's printing press, copies of the Bibles exploded, reaching far and wide. And it helped in the establishment and the advancement of Western civilization. And uh, as we think about our own country, it helped in the establishment and the advancement here. In fact, in 1636, a gentleman by the name of John Harvard established a university called Harvard Uni University. You probably know it better as Harvard University. <laughs> well, while he was establishing that, he had established a motto for the school, as well as a crest for the school. The motto was, truth for Christ and his church. And the crest were two books at the top, and they were open, faced up. And there was one book at the bottom, and it was face down. Now this was symbolism back then, and it symbolized the idea that human intuition, human intelligence, human, uh, the human mind had its limits. And in finding out truth, that the real truth was to be found in God's word. Well, sometime over the years, that, that changed. In fact, the motto changed for truth to, of Christ and his church to just truth. And there are three books that were there in that crest. The two that were faced up. And the one that was at the bottom that represented the Bible that was face down was now conspicuously turned over, faced up. Meaning there was no limits to human thinking, human reasoning, and human wisdom. That man was it. That man didn't need any longer the Bible. That he could find truth on his own. And so when we think about that school, we think about how it's representative of the fact of not only this country, but even our own schools who have turned the Bible back up. I just want to read you uh, a couple of uh, comments from that motto. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set time by prayer in secret to seek it of him. John Harvard, 1636. Harvard today, that's a long, long, far shot away from what just John Harvard just wrote. Harvard is not the same school. They changed the motto and they changed their purpose. 
to what it is today. But as we think about this idea of changing things, we know that as students of God's Word, that only wisdom, knowledge, and understanding comes from God's Word. We cannot attain wisdom. We cannot attain knowledge, true wisdom, true knowledge, apart from God's Word. And why? Why is that the case? Well, God tells us. The Holy Spirit, through Jeremiah, tells us. It's not in man to direct his own steps, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. The wise Solomon told us uh, th uh, that uh, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end of its way is death. Man can't find it on his own. He has to rely upon God's word, the Bible. And then, of course, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Stand ye in the ways and ask where the good ways is. Uh, and walk in it and you shall find rest for your souls. There is where we need to find ourselves. We need to confine ourselves within God's word. Those, that's the boundary. God's word is the boundary which we must confine ourselves in. The psalmist says, Your lamp is a light, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so we need that direction from God. The Bible contains everything we need to know for life. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. All things that pertain to life. Everything pertaining to life we can find in God's Word. Everything pertaining to godliness we can find in God's Word. Everything that we can learn about Jesus Christ we find in God's Word and in no other place. We gain this knowledge, we gain this wisdom through reading our Bibles, through studying our Bibles, and through making application of the teachings therein. Of course, when we don't do that, we don't have the knowledge for life, and we don't have the knowledge for godliness, and we certainly don't have the knowledge for Christ. So God's Word supplies this knowledge. Michael and I are members of a discussion group on Facebook. It's a rather large group. And uh, every now and then you'll find people making some comments about, well, you're relying on your knowledge. You're relying on your own wisdom. Well, that's not the case at all. What we're relying on is God's wisdom, God's knowledge that's found in God's Word. When we take that in, when we get back to studying, when we get back to applying, then we're taking what's His wisdom and what's His knowledge and up taking it into our hearts. Making it mine. But it's His. I didn't put that wisdom in there. I didn't put that information in there. And I certainly had no way to put the knowledge in there. And neither did you. But when we read and study God's Word, we have that wisdom and that knowledge. Paul put it this way, Now, brethren, I commend, to you, uh, commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those that are sanctified. And then Paul put it this way, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. The grace of God teaches us. It instructs us to live soberly, that is, sensibly, reasonably, and for Terry Hightower, logically. That's how we are to live. And then he says we're to live righteously, rightly, justly, agreeably with God, and in no other way. And then we have this knowledge when we do that. We have this knowledge, God's knowledge, God's wisdom, God's thoughts, God's intents. We have that in God's Word. This knowledge can only be found in the Word of His grace, the Bible, where the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ are found between two covers. That's where it's found. But where there is revelation, there is inspiration. And we have 
that mind of Christ. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. And we're going to touch on that in just a little bit. The Bible is infallible, never failing, ever reviving, always relevant, forever settled in heaven. The psalmist praised God's word, the Bible. You know, we've been uh, charged with being bibliologists, worshipers of the Bible. There's a wonderful passage in the Bible. In Psalm 138, verse 2. There the Bible tells us that God has magnified His Word above His name. How high is His name? Well, His Word's even higher. Now, God has put all His love, all His grace, all His power, all His might, and extending mankind this Word. That's above His name. That's not worshiping. That's just giving honor to whom honors do. God magnified and glorifying His name. So there's no other book but the Bible that we need to rely upon for getting ourselves saved. But the question, therefore, for us this evening is, how did we get the Bible? How did it all come about? But before answering those questions... We need to understand that the Bible does not begin with a 12-step program in believing in God. Uh, it, it doesn't offer a class on how to believe in God. The Bible says it this way. In the beginning, God. God just bursts upon the scene. And there He is. There's no apologetics class. God is. And because God is... God's Word is. God's Word comes from God because God is. Now let's talk about the process. Let's talk about from God to man. All of the content of the Bible is revelation. Revelation discloses what had been previously unknown. God revealed His will, making known His thoughts, desires, intentions, all for mankind. Without God revealing all of this, we would not ever know intimately who God is. Paul said it this way, How that by revelation I made known to you the mysteries. That by revelation I made known to you. That begins the process. And as we think about revelation and inspiration, they are two peas of the same pod. They, they go hand in hand. And the revelation of this content involves a process. And the process by which the contents of the Bible was revealed is called inspiration. The Bible makes clear there's a distinction between revelation and inspiration. Brother Jerry did a great job last night in explaining 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 concerning revelation, concerning inspiration. And I just want to kind of dovetail upon what he said. He talked about these things. These things that Paul was talking about. These things referred to the things that Paul had given to the apostles. The gospel. The preaching. The message of Christ. All the teachings found therein. Now, I haven't seen too many people up here open their Bibles and have you follow along, but I'm going to do that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. I want us to walk us through this particular passage because I think there's a lot of abuse to this particular passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read verse 13. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, to understand what he's talking about, we need to go back to chapter 1. And I want us to go back to verse 5. Go back to verse 5, if you will. And I just want to highlight some, some different verses as we go through the context. In verse 5 of chapter 1, Paul writes that in everything you are enriched by Him. And uh, 
And in fact, that's uh, the past tense there. And that the fact that they were enriched. They were enriched. Now, something changed. Something happened along the way. Well, he talks about that in verse 10, talking about division, talking about uh, speaking the same thing, and being of the same mind and of the same judgment. And notice in verse 11 what Paul says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Contentions, divisions. This is what's going on. So in verse 5 he says, which you were, but something has happened, and now you are this. There's some division among you. There's some contentions and strife that is going on here in the congregation. And then we jump to verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Well, there's the problem. He's talking about wisdom, wisdom of the world. Evidently, those who were causing divisions were raising themselves as, up as being wise. Wiser than perhaps Paul. And as we continue on down, it says in verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Well, there's your culprits. You have two groups of people that comprise a church, Jews and Greeks, and there's more headbutting going on between these two classes of people. These two groups of Christians. Jews are seeking a sign. Greeks are seeking wisdom. Well, as we continue on down to chapter 2, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he begins his discourse here in chapter 2. And we go to verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Who's the us? Well, the us is Paul, number one. Number two, it's the apostles and perhaps Apollos, as we'll soon see here in just a second. But then we jump on down to verse 13 again, which things also we speak. We is equal to the us. The we and the us are the apostles. They're the inspired men. They're the inspired men that Paul is referring to. The we and the us is not talking about you and me, but them. There's a big difference. There's a lot of misunderstanding about this passage. And as he continues, look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man. Paul's a spiritual man. The apostles were the spiritual men. The inspired men. They were the spiritual men. Why? Because the Spirit was working through them. Delivering the message. The natural man. The Jew or the Greek here. Those who were insisting upon showing the people that they had some sort of wisdom. They were causing divisions. And yet they were not receiving any revelation from God, nor were they inspired of God. And then verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul's talking about himself again and his compatriots. We have the mind of Christ. Today we might by extension say we have the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. This is the mind of Christ in Scripture. But notice, as chapter 3 begins, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. For, and we'll jump down to verse 3, For ye are not carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Paulos, are ye not carnal? Now, if everyone here in Corinth had the mind of Christ, there would not be the division. There would not be this carnality. That's what Paul's saying. And so he's treating them. He says, you're still babes in Christ. When I came to you, I fed you as children, as little babies. And you're still in the infancy stage. 
you're still carnal, carnally minded. And so we know here from this context that the we and the us found in chapter 2 and verse 10 and chapter 2 and verse 13 are referring to Paul and other inspired men who were delivering the message that God was revealing to them. And he makes it clear that there was a revelation that God received. He says, you don't know the mind of, of, of another person unless someone reveals it to you. Unless I reveal myself to you, you don't know what's in my mind. The same thing with God. But God has revealed that to inspired men who in turn revealed it to the Corinthians. And we have that in writing and now revealed to us. And there is part and parcel of what we're talking about with the difference between revelation and inspiration. Now, according to Gosson, inspiration is that inexplicable power which the divine spirit aforetime exercised upon the authors of Holy Scripture to guide them even to the word which they have employed and to preserve them from all error as well as from any omission. In other words, the inspiration that was given to them was given to them by the Holy Spirit, giving them not only the words to be used, but the exact words, the exact tense, the exact mood, the exact gender of those words were chosen by the Holy Spirit. Everything in Scripture is there because God wanted it there. And uh, some refer to this as the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible, meaning that every word, verbal, in the entire Bible, plenary, is Holy Scripture inspiration. Of course, we should be careful not to confuse natural inspiration with God-breathed inspiration. Saying someone was inspired to write or say something is a result of being indirectly motivated by someone or something. Perhaps a writer draws inspiration from another source, such as a person or an object. An artist might do that. On the other hand, Bible inspiration always involved a direct or miraculous activity of God providing men with supernatural guidance in speaking and writing for God. To further understand what is meant by the word inspiration, Paul writes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. All, all, plenary, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Greek word there, theopanoustos, or theonoustos, meaning God breathe. God is breathing out. God is expiring. God is spiriting. That is the idea of God breathed. Packer writes, theopanoustos means outbreathe rather than inbreathe by God. Divinely expired. God breathed out all scripture. And that is directly connected to inspiration. Therefore, the inspiration of scripture is God's authority, which is illustrated by what the scripture says God says. Isn't that what Paul said when he wrote to the Corinthians? The things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. It's exactly right. When the apostle spoke, God was speaking through them. The people recognized that, and I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. Although God used men to write scriptures, none of the words they wrote down originated with them. It is through this inspiration that men of God were able to both speak and record in writing divine words. While God provided these men with the words to use, they were still able to write using their personalities, their demeanor, their backgrounds, perceptions, experiences. I can't explain that all, but that's how it happened. Peter, uh, such is the miracle of inspiration. Of course, this is the point Peter makes when discussing this particular phenomenon. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
Now here we learn some things about inspiration of Scripture. First, Peter emphatically declares that Scripture is not the product of man. Men did not, could not, ever would be able to ever conduct such a work, conceive such a work, produce such a work. They were moved by the Holy Ghost, speaking and writing the words of God. Second, there are key words we need to consider. Peter, by the Spirit, uses the Greek word, ooh, which carries an absolute negative. It's an impossibility. In no way, not ever. That's what that means. Man could not write such a thing, could not conjure up the ideas that there are found in those scriptures. Second, the verb pharaoh, not pharaoh, but pharaoh, means to bear, to carry along, convey, produce, to bring forth. And this is what the word image is like, the wind blowing a vessel on the ocean. No message was ever conveyed, born, carried along, produced, brought forth by an act of human will. Instead, men were moved by the Holy Ghost. The His Spirit provided them the supernatural ability to speak and write the words from God. Third, the Greek word apo comes before the word God, meaning this came out from God. He was the source of this. He was the inspiration. Finally, the passage stresses the passivity of man's involvement and even though they physically penned the words God gave them through His Spirit, those words to speak and to write. The Bible explains that David was inspired of God, and his example demonstrates what we're talking about. The Spirit spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2. Luke confirms this activity, saying, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs be, have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. Now in writing his first epistle to the Thessalonians and concerning the idea of inspiration, Paul says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as is the word of truth, the word of God which effectively, effectively worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. God selected various men to speak and write His will to mankind. These men were miraculously, supernaturally guided, aided by the Holy Spirit to ensure that what they were to say, to ensure that what they were to write would contain no errors, but would be infallible from God as God desired. The scriptures are indeed God's word and we can be assured of their authenticity, their authority, and their accuracy. Now let's talk about Bible formation, canonization, and transmission. The Bible, the word Bible, comes from the word Biblia, which is the singular. Biblion is the plural. And so here we find that is a plural for books or scrolls which were written on papyrus. The word scripture, which is synonymous with the Bible, comes from the Greek word graphi, meaning writings or the writings. As we noted above, all scripture, writings, is God-breathed. The Bible is actually a library consisting of 66 different books divided into two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 39 books in the Old, 27 in the New. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. The New Testament was primarily written in Greek, although there's a bit of Aramaic found in both. All of these books were written by 40, 40 men, inspired over a period of approximately 1,600 years. As God revealed His mind and inspired men wrote it down in the words of their language, they would do so on materials common for their time. So we have different materials such as stone, clay, papyrus, animal skins, leather, vellum, parchments. By the time of Christ in the first century, the Jews had divided the Old Testament into three sections, which today is known as the Tanakh. 
from the first letters of the Hebrew Torah, which is the law, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the, the writings, or the Psalms. And they usually call them the Psalms because the Psalms are first in order. So Jesus was familiar with this division between the law, the prophets, and the writings. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. In other words, the entire Old Testament testifies about Jesus Christ. Luke 24 in about verse 27, there we have the account of Jesus walking along with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. To Emmaus. And as they're walking along, they're learning uh, about the events of the day. And, and Jesus is asking them all sorts of questions. Jesus answers or asks these questions to find out where their heart is. And they've kind of given up. They should have known exactly what was going on through the scriptures of old. And so... Jesus then, therefore, takes this opportunity to give them a little Bible class, one-on-one. -on -one. And he says the same thing concerning, these things were written of me and Moses and the prophets. Sometimes the entire Old Testament is simply referred to as the law. I often find myself saying the same thing. When I refer to the Old Testament, sometimes I'll say the law. That's the way we find it. In John chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus answered them saying, it is, not, is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? And of course, that comes from the writings, specifically the Psalms. So, the Apostle Paul similarly refers to the entire Old Covenant as the law, and finally, in allegorical fashion, as the bondwoman. Paul referred to the Old Covenant as Holy Scripture as the oracles of God. Now we come to the term canon. Term canon comes from the Hebrew word canon, Greek word kenon, both meaning rule, measurement, standard. And so they had to meet a particular rule, a particular standard. How did we get these books? How do we know the book of Leviticus belongs in the Old Testament? How do we know the book of Matthew belongs in the New Testament? Well, let me just share with you what I think and what I think is the proper way of understanding this. When we talk about canonicity, we're talking about the way people recognized Scripture. The Jews recognized Moses. They knew that he was a man of God. They knew he was a prophet of God by the mighty works that he did on behalf of God. So when he wrote for instance, in Exodus, Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7, the people responded, yes, and we will do all that you have said, and we will obey the Lord. So what Moses said was from the Lord, and they recognized that. And so they recognized the person who was speaking, and as soon as they recognized him as a prophet, whatever he wrote was automatically and immediately accepted as canonical, as sacred, as being set apart as scripture. Moses gave the Jews instructions in identifying error, in preserving truth. Any teaching that was contrary to the already accepted canon of scripture at that time was to be rejected. Furthermore, if there was no miraculous evidence in connection with that teaching, it was to be rejected as well. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, verses 15 through 22. Therefore, we know God preserved his message in the Old Testament scriptures, safeguarding them through inspiration and guiding them. But this points us to the New Testament. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 31. The law, as we just talked about, the Old Covenant, was until Christ. Galatians chapter 3 in verse 19. Till the seed had come. The Hebrews writer begins his treatise by saying, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. 
And so we have here the beginning of the unfolding of inspiration and revelation in the new covenant. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the permanent, uh, preeminent spokesman of God, the one for whom the Old Testament prophets prepare. The Hebrews writer con contrasts the old revelation with the new revelation. God revealed himself in time past to the fathers in the prophets, dealing directly with the fathers of each household during the patriarch coal age. And during the Mosaic period, God expressed his will, men, of, uh, will to men through the prophets, such as Moses, Elijah, and Isaiah, etc. Those were the times past, or the old revelation. They came in different proportions, different times, and in different ways. And as I, Isaiah says, a little here and a little there. The revelation of the past came piece by piece and bit by bit. Of course, at the Transfiguration Mount in Matthew chapter 17, we find that the voice from heaven of God came and said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. No longer are you to hear, listen to Moses. No longer are you to hear Elijah, my Son. He's the standard now. Then Jesus takes His apostles upon teaching them and bringing them along, promised this, Promises them in John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And so in a similar fashion to the Old Testament, the apostles and the inspired men wrote down the words of God, creating scripture. The early church made copies and shared them with each other. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16. The Christians of the first century would immediately recognize this as scripture. The Thessalonians knew immediately that Paul's writings were Scripture and the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. They were able to discern those documents from the false ones which were floating around at that time. Then, of course, the early church had miraculous gifts. One of those gifts was the discerning of spirits. These people could tell which was false, which was phony, and which was baloney. And... They had these gifts to help them do that thing. Once an epistle was written, it was automatically regarded as scripture, as canonical. Why? Because they could recognize the person who gave it. Just as the people of old recognized Moses, and what he wrote was from God and set aside as sacred, the people saw that Paul or Peter would write, and, and they would set that aside as scripture. And of course, that began the copying process and the dissemination process in the regions and in the cultures around them. As we think about God's Word, the Bible, God's Word, the Bible, contains a plan for you and me. It contains a plan of salvation. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And, of course, as we read through the New Testament, that takes study. We find that it takes faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. That we must repent of our sins. Luke chapter three, uh, 13 and verse 3. That we must confess Jesus as Christ, as the Lord. He who confesses me before men, will, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. And, of course, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There is a fact and there is a promise. Salvation follows faith. Salvation follows baptism. There might be some out there who need that salvation, who need that plan. You can believe it and you can follow it. You can do so this evening. There might be some who have walked away from that plan and have strayed. God calls you back. God's saying, come back home. Come back. Get back on the right path again. And everything will be right. You're subject to the invitation of God in either of those two ways. We ask that you come forward now as together we stand and sing.